morning. I think the most uh, significant thing that's happened at the um, Khmer Rouge Court of the Extraordinary Chambers in Cambodia is the start of the main case against the senior uh, leaders of Democratic Cambodia. Um, I think, as, as many of you know, between 1975 and 1979, uh, the Communist Party of Cambodia took over um, Cambodia and ruled it and, and basically uh, attempted a social experiment to rapidly change that society from a, uh, a capitalist society to a um, socialist, agriculturist uh, revolution. Um, the cities were emptied within the first couple of days and uh, people were sent to labor camps and anyone that was perceived to be uh, a real enemy or a perceived enemy to those policies, those rapid policies, uh, were taken to torture centers and uh, many were killed and uh, some were attempted to, to be re-educated. The ultimate result of that regime was uh, two million, approximately two million victims, about one million uh, were executed and the rest died of uh, starvation, um, uh, medical, uh, lack of medical help uh, and disease. And so that was about one third to a quarter of the Cambodian population. Uh, the trial of that case started in November last year and it's been continuing right up until August. Uh, we've heard 100 days of testimony. We've had uh, many, many documentary debates on uh, the evidence that was discovered from the period. Uh, similar to uh, the German cases, uh, there was a trail of paper, not as significant and not as uh, all-encompassing as the Germans, but by the same token has given us an idea of who were the, the people most responsible. Witnesses have been coming and telling their stories. So for the people of Cambodia to have the second in charge of the Communist Party of Cambodia, the third in charge, and the seventh in charge on trial at the age of 84 to 86 is justice a long time coming. Uh, it's not over, it's a difficult exercise. Uh, we understand uh, the issues and the complexities that have been raised by Hans Carell in terms of setting up the court. Uh, were the Cambodian judges, did they have enough experience? Were the, uh, were the courts independent enough to be able to run these trials? Uh, the UN have become involved. It's a marriage between the UN and the Cambodian government. And in relation to the second trial, uh, we as a, as a prosecution team are trying our best to make sure that the evidence is on record as to um, the crimes occurring and the responsibility of these accused. And we think that the best way to counter um, perhaps criticism about whether this court should have been set up is to present evidence and lots of it to ensure that the, uh, that the trial, uh, if there are any convictions, it's done on evidence and the process is fair. It's a difficult exercise, but uh, this is the big going concern in Cambodia. Uh, the people have waited 30 years for this type of justice. Um, at the ECCC, um, we've had one trial. The person was convicted and on appeal and that, uh, that remained. We've got the other trial that's happening now, the three main senior leaders of Democratic Cambodia, and we have five other cases, five other cases under investigation um, of um, most of the people we think are most responsible for uh, the killings of hundreds of thousands of victims. That has been um, a thorn in the side of the Cambodian government in that uh, they wanted to limit the prosecutions to the five. And uh, as a result of that, um, there's a, a symmetry or, or a harmony between the, uh, the Cambodian uh, side of the court in the ju Judicial Investigation Judge's Office. They don't um, assist in the investigations and it's been, it's been a problem for the court um, to maintain um, the independence of the court and not have um, the government of the day decide who uh, will be prosecuted. Um, after the first investigative judge left, um, after three years, a new one was replaced and he was there for 10 months. And much to the surprise of the international community, uh, many of the decisions that were taken were consistent with uh, the prevailing opinion of the government at the time that these cases shouldn't be investigated. Um, and we thought the setup of the court 
being the UN and Cambodia set up, that the UN would make sure that uh, the judicial officials would carry out their functions, investigate, and not take instructions from the Cambodian government or the UN or anyone else. Um, unfortunately, with the second investigating judge, that didn't seem to happen. And it was a real affront to the, to the victims um, of the Khmer Rouge regime. It was a real affront to the, uh, the value of what a legal system is meant to be. Because many Cambodians know that their system isn't strong and it's not as independent as it should be. And they were expecting the UN, through their officials, to come in and make sure that the court is strong. And unfortunately, this investigative judge, um, his actions concurred with the uh, uh, views of the government at the time that there should be no further prosecutions for these five other accused, or five other suspects. Consequently, after four months, the investigative judge, the new second investigation, investigative judge closed the investigation after ordering the investigators to stay at their desks and not go out and investigate. They rejected applications from civil parties, which is one uh, valuable aspect of the civil law system that allows victims to participate as a party in the process. And they rejected applications which, in relation to the first case and the second case, which would have been admitted. And if I can just briefly say, uh, family members of people that were killed or executed were viewed under the rules to be victims under the, under the jurisprudence and under the law. That many thousands were allowed in the first and second case to participate. We get to the third case and fourth case related to these two five accused that uh, the government didn't want prosecuted and on the same grounds those civil party applications were rejected. And so what that meant that uh, no one would see um, that nothing was happening in relation to these prosecutions. And there's two, two controversies, I think, uh, at the ECC over the last year, and maybe there's been different ones in previous years, but, but one is in relation to the clash between law and politics, and one is just purely law. And in the last year, uh, we've had two investigative judges resign. And I talked about the second investigative judge that resigned um, on the basis of political pressure. Um, the difference between the resignation of the second investigative judge and the third one is that the second judge appeared to bow to political pressure and um, uh, didn't carry out the investigations and then left under the guise of, I was under pressure, um, I had to leave. But he was conforming with them. The third investigative judge, in fact, was trying to do his job was trying to investigate despite um, the government statements at various times um, that uh, these case, extra cases shouldn't be investigated. Um, however, um, he, that pressure was too much for him and, and for a number of reasons and, and things weren't going smoothly. Sometimes drivers weren't being, being made available for the cars to go out on investigations. Sometimes interpreters weren't being made available. Um, there was uh, dysfunction in the office between the Cambodians and the UN. Um, but however, the statute allows for the investigation to proceed, uh, for the uh, international investigator still to carry out his job. But it was too, too much pressure. And he left after five months. Uh, that's the positive end of the story, that the UN has decided to continue um, and push the idea that the court should be independent and rather than fold and say no more cases, um, they're deciding to make, try and maintain the independence of the court. And we hope with this starting in the next, um, two, or uh, next two or three weeks that um, um, it'll be a very positive development.